Okay. All right. So this is natural script writing with Guile by Pretend Arnie. Um, so Arnie's newest tap towards a perfect uh, script writing with syntax. So. Hello, audience and presenter. I am pretending to be Arnie. Arnie is imaginary and is not here. Presents his gratitude. Um, so, hello, Arnie. And then, audience should applause. That's what it says. Don't leave him hanging. He's not here, that would be so rude, but uh, you, luckily you fulfilled it. So this is the output of that program that we just saw. So, okay, the audience applauses and stuff like that. And so you can see there's this kind of cool, like it looks like plain text, but it's also got some scheme involved in there, kind of quasi quote -y. Um But, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so let's, uh, let's continue on. So apparently that's actual Guile code. Parse the scheme at read time. Um, there you can import the uh, language Wisp spec. So uh, he's got a whole website about Wisp. Um, if you haven't heard of Wisp, Wisp is this uh, um, kind of white space significant Lisp that Arnie's been working on, um, and it allows you to do uh, Lisp as if like it's it allows you to write Scheme in a very kind of like Pythonic natural looking way. Um, so we're Prior art, where do we start from? Um, presenter set, oh, okay. So I'm supposed to give those 15 seconds each. Okay, so so this is Battle for Wesnoth. Uh, I'm also familiar with this this structure here. What, um, these are, uh, um, they actually use INI style config files for their entire system, uh, including they actually embed programs inside of the string values of everything, um, like with the, their whole deal cell. So anyway, you know, verbose dialogues are not its main purpose, and yeah, you, you really don't want to embed programs inside of the values of strings and INI files. Okay, scum, seen from Monkey Isle. Hmm, not bad. Something's odd, but it does have the kind of actor, you know, it looks a little bit more like a script. All right. Python, his last try. You know, all these quotes, no action between the words. It doesn't look good. Look, you got three quotes there just to be able to say the thing and have a new line. Okay. Um, all right. So what's next? Spells with Lisp. So this actually, um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. There's this fun article about casting spells with Lisp. Um, there's also a book that called, came out called Land of Lisp that includes it as well. And it's got a little text adventure that you write inside of Lisp. You see, Lisp and text adventures, another connection. Um, and uh, you're, um, when you go in, in but it's, it looks very not natural, right? Okay. So, examples, where Arnie is. Um, so here's an example, looks very, very much so like writing, yeah, just kind of a script, but it's, again, got the string quasi-quoting. Um, and uh, the output looks good. It has the actual structure in there. Um, so uh, um, here's some more examples. Apparently this is actually, uh, this looks like it's a defining a list of answers here. Um, and again, it has the output, but you can see that it actually converted the stuff that was here because it was a list and it actually did uh, a map across it or something like that. Anyway, his summary is it works and he's happy and his next step is making games. Uh, main complication, shipping games made with Guile. Uh, you can find the source code in the Wisp repo here. Um, thank you. Thanks, Arnie. <laughs> Uh, here's apparently the basic version of the Three Witches thing. It's so, got... How many people are using Wisp? I don't know. I gave a talk. I have a blog post where I showed how to use it with uh, geeks. Uh, Dusty Cloud. I missed mean, I mean that one. Geeks, Wisp. Yeah, so, I mean, it's kind of cool because um, Wisp, list minus the parentheses. So I've used it. So you can see here, side by side, the same code, I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. So here's a Hello World example in Wisp, and here's a Scheme version side by side. And they, you can see they look pretty similar, right? So what Wisp mostly does is it can do any S expression language, not just Scheme, as long as it's got, um, as long as it knows how, to, and it knows how to convert things to the parentheses. So what, unlike a lot of other wi white space significant languages, it, you can do macros with it too, and stuff like that, right? Which is really hard, like if you've used like Julia, or Dylan or something like that. They're theoretically kind of Python-like syntax, but with macros, except uh, the, the, they actually use a completely different syntax for the macros thing because, you know, without, without something as cool as S expressions, you're just not going to get it, you know, I guess. Uh, but anyway, so here's the, uh, the, the um, here's a version of the uh, code side by side, where on the left you can see the geeks 
definition of grep um, in Scheme. And then if we shift to the right, you can see it actually looks pretty similar um, and actually I think quite readable. In fact, I gave a talk on this and I showed it to some friends and one of my friends said, wow, looking at the right version of things makes the left version of things a lot less scary. And he's like, and I don't like Lisp, right? Like, and so he's like, now I'm not as scared of parentheses, right? So I actually think that that's one of the coolest things about Wisp is that it, it might end up being, you know, a, a, a nice in-between of things, right? And of course, it would probably make this look a lot less gnarly um, with all my code. Although, of course, I love parentheses, so I don't mind it. Um, um, yeah, other questions? You can do questions for either Arnie's thing, because I can probably only answer to such a limited amount, or about concurrency or eight sync things. It's up to whatever. Uh, Arnie, is uh, WISP um, uh, intended uh, to, to make the entry into S expressions easier, or is it really intended to be uh, used? Uh, I think, it, I think it's, a, it's intended for both. Um, let's see, Arnie's website. <laughs> well, wait, does he have a live version of the thing that's happening right now? Live stream from the Guile development. Oh, man, that's so meta. We, uh, we get deep. <laughs> you have no idea, Artie. <laughs> okay, so um, I, his whole idea here, as far as I understand, was that he wanted to... Uh, and Artie came from Python originally, and he has a whole book that he wrote that you can find online about his experiences of moving from Python to Guile. And I think he was, he still found it really difficult to overcome the parentheses, and now he likes the parentheses, right? But, uh, but like, like many people, um, yeah, and he's quoting me here, haha. -ha. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess it's appropriate that I'm up here representing Artie. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and here's him from last year, even more meta. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, so yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> But I, so I think that it's actually intended to be both. You know, you could theoretically, you can, you can definitely write stuff in it, and I hope, think that Arnie hopes to that people will. But it's also, I think, reduces the a lot of the pain of coming into it. And I think it would be great if we had Wisp like as one of the languages that ship with Guile's def VM by default, right? Like we've got this theoretical VM tower, and it's so much of an easy match to Guile anyway. Like why not include Wisp with it, right? Like it seems like a pretty easy win for us to include it. And then when somebody's like, well, I would use Scheme, but I don't like those S expressions, we can be like, well, look at Wisp. And like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and just like Emacs emulating them, you're like, it's exactly like that other thing, except for in all the places that it's not. And then they go read the manual, and they're like, and it's like, don't worry, you don't have to understand the parentheses. And then they can go read the manual, and it's full of parentheses. And <laughs> but, but no, I think it's a pretty cool project. I think that Arnie's doing great work here. OK, another question about whatever. OK, I have a question for Chris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so about async, do you have a feel of the overhead of passing messages? Uh, so when I tested last, and I know, oh yeah, so the, the question is, what's the overhead pa of ma passing messages in async? So A, there's a lot of things that can be sped up. Like for example, I'm converting numbers to strings in there, and I actually could just have it not append the numbers to a string and just have them be separate, and then I wouldn't have that problem, right? So there's a lot of things that can be sped up. When I did a test on my LibreBoot X200, you know, from a decade ago, I was able to get about, I think, 25 to 50,000 messages at a time going for per second. Um, so not great, but not really good. But if you look at ACA, which is a Java like actor model thing, they've got a, uh, they've got a, I think on modern machines, so I have no idea what it would be on my X200, they've got about like a million messages a second or something like that. So it can be improved. I've, there's also, I think, a bug um, that you won't notice in the mud, but I know about it, where uh, I, I keep accidentally adding a prompt every time you resume one of the delimited continuations. So that's adding some overhead, that's, but it's just a bug and it can be improved. So I don't really know, but for me, it feels like 25,000 messages per second is, for most things that you're gonna be doing, is probably good enough. And you could also probably like, so I'm planning on writing a web server application and for that, 
the majority, I'm not planning to break it into as many fine-grained act, uh, actors as like the mud, right? It's okay to do your usual thing where you have like the views and you have like a request comes in and it runs through the whole thing and then runs out, right? So you could just have an actor for the web server and then, you know, when you've got your database thing over there or you've got, you're running like, if we were, it was Media Goblin and you're process, transcoding videos, you can have an actor for the transcoder or something like that, right? So you might only have a few actors kind of rarely sending messages between each other in that kind of case. So I don't know, 25K seems like okay enough for now. I'm not happy with it, but I'm not unhappy with it. So, yeah. So, so ACA uh, passes messages by reference because they keep uh, guaranteed immutability and the same thing happens in Erlang. Are, are you copying or are you actually passing by reference? So I'm not copying, I'm passing it by reference and also in ACA, I listened to a talk on that on the plane here. They don't completely guarantee immutability. It's like probably immutable by default, yeah. but which is, you know, like, and so in here, I'm in mud sync for the entire thing. I'm passing S, like, pr, like classic list S expressions between all these things, right? Um, for the most part, like I'm passing anything that could be written by scheme right, basically. Um, so this, it would be fine. As long as nobody takes one of those cells that I send and then mutates it by doing like set critter, and then just ruins my program, right? Like as long as they don't do that, it's fine, right? And uh, um, and you even could pass a mutable thing to another actor if you're going to never rap handle it again or something, and you're in the same address space. But uh, um, but right, so this doesn't serialize it between each thing. It actually just constructs the record of the message and then it does that. So it's by reference. Cool. Uh, uh, unless if you're sending it to something on a different process, of course it's going to serialize before. Yeah. Uh, Anyone else? Any questions? Tim, you have a question, Alex? Yeah, I was just going to ask like, how you see the, the future of like, async and, and fiber. Like, is it basically, are they going to be like two separate projects that will remain two separate projects, or do you think that one of them is going to become the de facto kind of? So the thing about dual that I said earlier, one cool thing about duality is that you can implement one on top of the other. So it's possible. Um, so Andy Wingo is definitely a way better programmer than I am, right? Like I'm unintentionally having prompts stack up without realizing it, right? Like I don't think Wingo would make that mistake because he like knows how things work and I don't, right? Um, and like, uh, um, and uh, but like, so fibers I think is probably a lot faster right now and stuff like that. And I would like to borrow the same data structure that they're using for the fiber, for the scheduler, which is actually borrowed from Ian Price's PFDS library. Um, but uh, um, whether or not they're going to merge or not, I don't know. Well, first of all, they implement two very similar but technically different um, abstractions, right? CSP versus the actor model, right? Those are not the same thing, but they can be implemented on top of each other. Um, I don't really know. One of the things I was going to have, so CSP I think is a lot more mathy in some ways too, right? The actor model also has actually a fully like developed math concept, right? Of course, I'm using goops, which like immediately makes me feel extremely unmathy. Um, but, uh, um, but the, uh, but, uh, by the way, I was originally, I never had time to program it in here, but I was originally going to have a room that you could go into inside the 8-sync hive, which would be the 8-sync mutation chamber, and there would be a bunch of actors, like each one of them inside of a, a vat, and they each send a message, and then they like mutate horribly, and then there's like this woman who's like a functional programmer in the corner, and she's like, ugh! disgusting every time that it mutates. And like if you chatted with her, she's like, she's like, follow the white rabbit to see like the functional future version of actors. And then you can like follow the white rabbit and you go in there and then like they've got actors. And then instead of mutating horribly, every time that a message comes to them, they actually clone with a modified version of itself. And the old body gets thrown on top of the garbage collector and then like dumped into a chute. And she's like, this is much more humane. <laughs> but I never got around to coding it. So I just had to describe it. Uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, I, I don't really know. I want to, and I think Wingo doesn't know either. Like w Wingo and I both in our dot manuals both reference each other's library. Um, and I think the main reason for that is that nobody really knows, right? Like it could be that eventually just fibers turns out to be way better than 8sync and I'm just like, well, I'm just moving over to fibers, right? I don't know. Um, and uh, um, I think that, and in, in I think in Wingo's some writing that he did, he said it's too early to guarantee what the proper high-level 
concept of things is in Guile right now, but like we can collaborate on the low-level concepts. So suspendable ports, for example, is kind of the low-level side of things, and then we can experiment in the high-level thing. And I think that's good. You know, unfortunately, it does mean that maybe eventually I'll completely rewrite MudSync to be, you know, in in fibers or something like that. But in the meanwhile, I think it's still, you know, it's still fun. It's still fun to experiment with. By the way. 8sync is in Geeks, so you can, and I think Fibers will be soon, hopefully, Lingo said he was going to try to add it, I don't know if he did, um, I ran into troubles while trying to package it, but I think he said it could be packaged now, but anyway, so if you want to check out Guile-8sync and start playing around, there's a full tutorial, if you go to the uh, 8sync, um, there is a full tutorial, there's not API documentation, who needs that? But if you go to the tutorial, it'll actually walk you through from writing an IRC bot to writing your own network-enabled actor, and then it just talks about how great Emacs is. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so I probably answered that in over detail. Anybody else have any questions about any of these things or whatever? Just a suggestion. Why don't you take this talk about the Python from sort of Python dev room next year? Maybe, maybe after road testing it, just to check the Python. Oh, you mean the, the Python-like syntax? Yeah. Um, okay, well, I mean, I'm not Arnie, so Arnie should do it for sure. But as meta Arnie, yeah, uh, <laughs> as meta Arnie, I say, that's a great idea. I should show up there. I should talk about my experiences of moving from Python to Guile and then show why I wrote this other thing that makes me feel like I'm writing Python, but I'm actually writing Scheme. Um, so, yes, I think it's a good idea as meta Arnie. Uh, anybody else? I mean, we could just take a break or something. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, we've got 12 minutes till the next talk. All right. Everybody's able to, for the first time in this entire thing, we've got, like, an actual break. So, all right. Thanks, everybody.